All right, 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. As we always do here at Strong Old Baptist Church, we're going to read the entire passage out loud. You could follow along silently while I read, starting in verse number 1 of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. The Bible reads, Dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren? But brother goeth to law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. Now therefore there is utterly a fault among you, because ye go to law one with another. Why do ye not rather take wrong? Why do ye not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Nay, ye do wrong and defraud, and that your brethren. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of enemy. <clears throat> meats for the belly and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise up us by his own power. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for another opportunity to meet together uh, in your house. God, I pray that you would please fill me with your spirit and your power, dear Lord. Help me only to say those things that are right. Lord, lead me and guide me. Uh, uh, help my mind to be sharp tonight. And I pray that you would just give us all ears to hear and hearts to, to understand and receive the things that we can learn from your words today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so this evening's sermon is kind of a part two from this morning's sermon. This morning, uh, the, the title of my sermon was, was Biting and Devouring. And I preached on just kind of the spirit of the church, how the church should be, how should we be long-suffering, and we're here to serve and to love one another and to do good works, and we want our church in unity, and we can't get caught up in a, a biting and devouring type of, of attitude, especially internally. Right, it's really important that we have a good spirit within our church. So as a segue into this evening's sermon, you know, this evening I want to talk just about sp a little bit more specifically about what to do when you do have a conflict with someone. Now, there's a lot of reasons that people can have conflicts with other brothers in Christ, brothers and sisters in Christ, or other church members. And how do we deal with that? What is appropriate? You know, how are we supposed to keep unity in the church when there's problems going on. Well, it's, I mean, at a real high level, you know, it's good to have unity in your family, right? You have brothers, sisters, mom, dad, but sometimes you're going to have friction and you're going to have problems. And sometimes you're going to have people doing others wrong and you got you to gotta figure out how to move forward as a family unit and, and continue on and, and also maintain the, the core and the strength and have a strong, loving family, even though things may come up. And some things may be more serious than others, and we need to learn how to deal with all of those. So what we're going to do today, we're going to look at two main passages of Scripture that have to deal with the church and, and basically some things that are taught 
on what to do. The first one has to do with going to law, right? Suing somebody. And then the other one's in Matthew chapter 18 where Jesus is giving instruction. And what we're going to, we're, we're going to derive principles from that to be more applicable in even more situations than just the ones that are mentioned. And this is how you have to, if you want to, if you want to know how, what's right in basically any situation, you're going to need to learn how to do this of just deriving the principle from scripture to apply it more broadly because not every situation is listed in the Bible for every possible scenario. So we need to be able to learn wisdom and understanding based on what the Bible gives us. So before I get into even all of this, you know, th this is kind of my, my thoughts. We're, we're going we're gonna to dig into this real deep. I don't have as many notes on this. But when it comes to dealing with problems with people just in general, we need to understand what is appropriate. And we talked about this real briefly after service this morning, and there was a good conversation. I, I kind of want to reiterate some of the things that I had said then, because they weren't necessarily specifically in my notes. But when you have a problem with someone, and we'll see this play out here soon, the, the one that I really want to deal with the most is the online. Like, when, when is it appropriate? How do you deal with things when you have a problem with someone? Publicly, privately, semi-publicly, right? Because there's instances where the church may need to know about things. And then there's other instances where they don't. We're talking about this. You know, what if someone's guilty of a 1 Corinthians chapter 5 sin? 1 Corinthians chapter 5 lists off drunkards, extortioners, fornicators, right? All these different things that if someone's called a brother, you know, you're not supposed to even eat with that person. We're supposed to put away from among yourselves that wicked person, right? So how public do you get with that? Because there's someone that needs to be put away. Well, we're still they're still considered a brother. They're a brother, someone who's saved. They're not a wolf in sheep's clothing. They're not a false prophet. They're not trying to sow discord. They're just involved with sin. Well, you know what? A brother like that, they don't need to have their sin exposed to the whole world. Right? Now, they do need to be, the church needs to understand, hey, this person is guilty of whatever they've done here, which is why we're going to separate from them. They're not going to be coming to church until they repent. So at some level, the church needs to know, okay, oh, I mean, like, what is he guilty of? But you know what we're not going to do is share every detail, yeah. right? I mean, if someone's guilty of fornication, well, it's fornication. We don't need to go into any specifics, any nitty gritty, oh, here's with this person or that person or what, you know, like, that's not the point. The point is, this person's found to be in fornication, so this is what we're doing per 1 Corinthians chapter 5. What I don't want to do is just not mention that at all, and you just, oh no, just trust me. They did something that they shouldn't be doing, and you know, that's not right. right. I mean, you, you, you need, at least need to know why, because then you have someone in church that's, well, I'm friends with that person. What do you mean it's not, you know? No, just, just enough for people to know. But you know what we're not going to do? We're not going to go broadcast that on social media and start putting out video. Oh, man, this person did this and that. Why? Because we want them to repent and get right. So the appropriate punishment from God is just, you know what? Shun them. Right. Just shun them. Okay, have nothing to do with them. And that's it. And you don't need to start adding more affliction on top of the shunning and just say, you know what? That is, if the, you know what? If God wanted you to do that, he would have told us to do more. But God is not merciless. He's not unmerciful. He says, nope, this is what you need to do. You separate yourself from them. And you know what? If they repent, you bring them back in. The problem is, is that if you just start going over the top, first of all, it's going to be less likely that a person's going to repent because now they're getting these personal attacks on them and that, that, that is going to stay with them. You know, when, when the things that you say out of your mouth, whether it's, you know, verbally or online, they stay with people. I mean, you all know this is true. Husbands and wives, you know, sometimes you say things, and you got to be real careful with this because when you say things, you can't take them back. You can't pull that back into your mouth. Once it's out, it's out. And, and the really hurtful things, they stay, and they're going to stay in your memory. And, and you know, it's not going to be for the better. And you're going to need, as a family, to continue to move forward. So one of the ways that you, you guard yourself from having that hurt and that injury is, is watch your mouth. 
In a similar way, you know, when someone is guilty of a sin and needs to be cast out of church and we're dealing with that, you don't need to then start throwing the assault on that person that's already been kicked out because there's no point to that. It's not going to do any good. It's not going to bring any fruit. It's not going to make them repent any faster. And in fact, if you really want that person restored and coming back to church, why would you want to go somewhere? Like, Man, this person said this about me. This person said this about me. I don't want to go back there. Even if they do repent and get right with God, because who are they sinning against? They're sinning against God. Those being covetous, you know, being a drunkard, they're sinning against God. They need to get right with God. You don't need to add on to that. So when that happens, there's no reason to make any public announcements or statements about that. It is what it is. Just go and, okay, they need to get right. When they get right, they're welcome back in. We're going to love them and, and forgive them. And I brought up this morning how important that is too about having that forgiveness. Like we saw in 2 Corinthians where he says, okay, sufficient to such a one it was a punishment thereof. Okay, now you need to comfort him and bring him back. So that's one situation. The situation where a public thing would be appropriate, and you can, you can get this from Scripture too, how often do you see names being named? Not very. It does happen. Yes, it does happen. But does it happen? Did we know, and this was a, this was a great point that was brought up earlier this afternoon, who the person was who was committing fornication with his father's wife? Do we have that name? No. You know who we do know? We know Hymenaeus, we know Alexander, we know Philetus. We, we know people who were sowing discord. We know people who were preaching doctrine contrary to the doctrine that was received and overthrowing the faith of many. Right? We, we have those people. The people that we needed to withdraw from, like Romans 16 says, the ones that you mark and avoid, those are the ones that are made a public example. That's where it's appropriate to say, hey, this person, watch out for this person. This person is a wolf. This is a bad person. Watch out. They're preaching damnable heresies. They're, they're causing this division. Those are the people that need to be called out publicly. But anything other than that, why do you need to take things to a public platform? Especially if it's a brother or sister in Christ. There's none. So when is it appropriate to bring things online? Almost never. And that's, the, you know, I, I mentioned this morning how I just kind of don't get online that much on the social media because I'm kind of sick of it. Because people don't know how to keep their dirty laundry to themselves. They just air it out to the world. And first of all, no one wants to see that. Second of all, it's embarrassing and a shame and I think oftentimes people don't even realize what they're doing to themselves when they, when they post this stuff, even if they're in the right. It doesn't matter if you're in the right. You don't start going and posting all this stuff out there. It makes you look bad. Just keep it to yourself. Keep it internal. Don't go and just post everything in your whole life on the internet. It's not appropriate. And it's, you know, young people, they really need to understand this. Is not appropriate to just publish your entire life to the world. It's going to get you in trouble, and it's going to it's going to just ultimately cause problems. Like I said, you can't take things back. You may be involved in a, in a problem with someone, and then that problem can be resolved. But you know what? Then all this stuff is still out there forever. And then it's just going to be a thorn in your side. And it's going to be something that you know. It's hard enough. I mentioned before, people just saying things, right? It's hard enough to get past that and to let those wounds heal once you've already let things out of your mouth. But nowadays with, with the internet and with, and with the computers, that stuff doesn't go away. You're, you're on Facebook and you're like, here's your post from six years ago, right? And it's, and it's like on your feed and you're like, oh, I said that. And it comes back to, to haunt you and bite you. Look, careful with that. And you know what? There's no reason. The vast majority of problems with people, there's no reason that everybody needs to know about it. There's none. And I'll give you this piece of information too. Again, going back to just marriages, and this sermon is not about marriages, but you want to have a good marriage? You and your wife 
or you and your husband, right, if you're a man or a woman, right, you're on the same team. And, what, you know, you're going to run into times where you get into fights with each other and disagreements and arguments. Don't ever go to someone else and start complaining about your spouse to that person. That will do you no good. Because whoever you go to is going to be on your side. Because that's who you want. You, you, you're not going to go to, you know, like, like the wife's not going to go to the husband's family, most likely, the husband's mom, you know, and be like, do you know what he's doing? Because mom's going to be on son's side or whatever, you know, whatever. Right? I know there's going to be different families out there be like, no, you can go to the... <laughs> the point is, you don't need anyone to reaffirm your side against your spouse. You need to figure out how to reconcile with your spouse without getting anyone else involved. Because what happens is, and this happens oftentimes, especially in new marriages, it doesn't happen as much, you know, the longer you're together, the more you realize what a bad idea it is to go and, and talk to other family members about your problems. Newer marriages, they start going off and telling their, you know, their parents. Or their, and you know what that does? That starts to paint a really bad picture about your spouse in their mind. And you know what? You, as the spouse, you love them, you're going to forgive them or whatever if there's something that they did wrong, and you move past that, but then the family doesn't. And you know what? That was never their business to begin with. It's something that's happening in the house. And it's something that you were so upset about and you just had to tell everyone because you're right. And you need someone else to tell you that you're right. And it causes problems. And it's the same mentality. Now, look, those are things that happen, you know, that shouldn't. You kind of talk about and, and gossip and tail bearer with people who, who it's not their business at all. But then bring that to the online world. And it magnifies the problem tremendously. Okay, so look, that, none of that was in my notes, but this is just some wisdom. Take it or leave it. Okay, I encourage you to take it. And if you're young and if you're not married yet, take this to heart. Okay, learn how to, how to work out your problems because there will be problems. There will be problems no matter how much you love the other person and they love you. When you start living together with someone, you learn things that you didn't know before. And there's little quirks and people get irritated and get on each other's nerves and you're going to have, you're going to have issues. Yeah. You work through them together without getting <laughs> All right, Brother Peter, you settle down now. We know. <laughs> there's going to be problems. Did I say that? No, <laughs> It's best just to keep that together and, and maintain the mindset. We're in this together. We're a team. We're one flesh, right? Let's work it. Well, in a church now, similarly, we're one family. Okay, when we have problems within a church, we don't need to go and start broadcasting this out to other places and letting everyone else know, well, hey, well, we're running this problems in our church. No one needs to know that. It's our church. If we've got a problem in here, we'll deal with our problems in our church. And you know, we also don't need to get involved in anyone else's problems either. They're having problems in their church. Well, I'll pray for them. I hope things get well. You know, if, they, if, if someone needs something from us, I'll try to help, but we're not going to go. And, you know, and this is why you'll notice, I don't just stick my nose in everything that's going on and every, you know, one pastor saying this and one person saying that and this, you know, and there's all this stuff going on. I don't get involved in that. Because it's not my beef. It's not my problem. I don't need to make a stand on something. I'm trying to fight hard enough against the, the real enemy, Satan, and, and you know, try to do the good work. I don't need to be getting involved in anyone else's conflicts. And I'd like to remain friends with people who are doing a good work for the Lord. It's not my business, not my problem. And I don't care if people are going to be looking at, oh, what do you think about this? It doesn't matter what I think. It's not my business. Doesn't matter. I, do you have an opinion? Yeah, I've got an opinion. You've got an opinion. He's got an opinion. You've got an opinion. But it's not my business. Not my problem. So who cares? We learn how to deal with conflicts and deal with problems. 1 Corinthians 6 deals with going to law. Okay? 
And this is pretty simple and, and you know, just on the surface, this probably won't come up. Maybe when we grow, it might, it might become an issue. But for something like this to happen, for you to go to law against somebody, it's probably going to happen over something financial. Destruction of property, maybe something stolen, broken, you know, whatever, right? Misunderstanding, someone doing some work for you, not getting paid, those types of situations that would be the thing that would come up probably most commonly within a church, right? Somebody's, but the bottom line is someone's wrong. You're not going to take someone to court if there's no wrongdoing, right? A little bit later, I'm going to go into personality conflicts and other type of, of problems that you can have with people, but it's not like they literally did something to you, right? Those are, those are the, the, the more minor things. And the Bible doesn't even tell us how to deal with that, but that's why we're going to take the principles from the more major things and apply them to the minor things. So what the Bible's instructing us here is saying, look, don't go to law. Don't sue your brother in Christ and take that before the courts of the unbelievers. I mean, this world's government system and suing someone in civil court, when you've got a problem with a brother or sister in Christ, he's saying, you know what? You're, I mean, this is talking about people in the church. You both should be able to relinquish authority to the church and at least be able to judge and say, you know what? Someone here ought to be able to understand enough of, of what's right and wrong in God's eyes to be able to make a judgment, right? You don't need to stand before some person dressed in a black robe who's got a degree on the wall that they've studied the, the human government laws, however much they studied it, and, and, and submit to that judgment when you've got, hopefully, I mean, there ought to be. If there's not, then it's a shame to the church. People who know the Bible well enough to be able to make a reasonable judgment on what's right and what's wrong and be able to determine, okay, who's at fault? What happened? Here's a reasonable judgment. This is what you do and move on. Right? This is what the Bible is teaching. And, it, and it's very clear, very simple. It's sinful to go out and just, and just do that. But this is what it's saying. Let's just reread it. Okay, verse number one. Dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest of matters? So first of all, he's saying, like, don't you even know you're going to be judges? So if you're going to be judging the world, can't you judge these small matters? Like, I mean, seriously, like you can't handle this? You have to go to, law, go to the courts? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? Verse 4, If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. So people who are not going to be swayed or influenced or anything, you know, people are going to be impartial, right? Set them to judge. He says, I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. Like you don't even have anybody that can do this job. Like seriously, you don't have somebody that can, that can make a judgment. He says, but brother, go to law with brother and that before the unbelievers. Now he continues on. He says, now therefore there is utterly a fault among you because ye go to law one with another. So now he's saying there's a fault. Look, why are you, why are you even bringing each other to court. He says, why do you not rather take wrong? So he's saying, if someone's done you wrong, why don't you just forget about court and just, just say, okay, well, I've been wronged and move on and forgive and just, and just forget about it and, and not have to cause this extra contention and fighting of going to court with somebody. Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Now, this is a clear case of someone defrauding someone else, right? Someone's in the wrong. And he's saying, well, why don't you then, if, if this has happened to you, just say whatever. That's a fault that they had of not being able to do that, of putting too much importance on whatever the physical good is, the physical things where they've been wrong. Now, is it right for somebody to be wrong? Of course not. Should, should they be held accountable for it? Yes, they should. But he's saying, don't bring it to the courts. Deal with that in-house. And better yet, just 
say whatever. You know, if I lend money to someone and then they just fail to pay me back and it's agreement, okay, here we go. I'm going to lend you hundred bucks. Two weeks from today, here's the date I get paid. I'm going to pay you your money. Great. Date comes and goes and then they stop, you know, talking to you and it's like, you don't go then and say, well, I'm going to sue you to your brother. Okay. Is it right for that person not to pay you back? No, of course it's not right. It's wicked to, to not pay that, that, you know, your, your debts and to get involved in that. But what we're, the, the principle that we're learning here is that it's better just to, just to let it go. Just to suffer yourself to be defrauded because at the end of the day, as I mentioned this morning, God sees all these things. He knows what happened. So if he sees you taking the moral high ground and saying, you know what, whatever. I'm not going to allow this to be a problem. You know, you, it doesn't mean you have to keep lending to that person again, but you just say, fine, I'm not going to make a big issue out of this. I lost some money, whatever. God will take care of me. That is the way. And then he says, nay, ye do wrong and defraud and that your brethren, which is obviously another problem. You guys are defrauding each other. What do you, you know, what's your problem? Yeah. And this is your brother. You know, it always, it, you know, boggles my mind when you hear of crimes within like family, you know, physical families, you know, brother or sister, you know, stealing from their parents or stealing, you know, it's like you're supposed to have a, you know, a sanctity within the home. Well, you know, it's the same thing within the church. You know, some woman leaves her purse on the, on the, on the, in the row or something like you ought to be able to leave something without worrying about people coming and stealing your stuff in church, right? How, how wicked is that? But you know what? If something like that were to happen, we're not going to go and call the cops and, and then bring up this court case about some missing money or something like that. But here's what we do do is when there's um, a situation that's criminal, okay, because this is, this is talking about someone being wronged and being defrauded. Defraud is going to be have more to do with like a financial type of a thing. If someone is like physically injured, you know, whether it be really serious, like a rape or a murder, or, you know, even just kind of battered and things like that, it's like, there is a law for that. And that is the scope of authority that God has given to the human government and not to the church, right? So those are the matters that are going to be punished. You know, the, the establishment of the government is for the punishment of evildoers. The church authority is not for the punishment of evildoers. God never gave, okay, church, you're going to judge and you're going to punish the evildoers this way within the church. The evildoers are punished that way, but the, you know, the kind of the more financial things and those other stuff that we handle in house and that ought to be handled in house, even though there are laws pertaining to that stuff, we deal with it here, judge it here and, and move forward. And that's, and that's the, the principles here. So, um, the principle is dealing with problems within the church to get a righteous judgment. And again, within the scope and authority that's given to the church by God, and then the other principle is to just humble yourself and suffer the wrong done. Be merciful, forgiving, move forward. Those are main principles. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew 18, we're going to start reading in, chap in verse 15. Matthew 18, 15, the Bible reads, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man, and a publican. So here we see again, here's another instance. It's similar to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, but we have a brother trespassing against you. So they have done something to you that's wrong. Okay, that's not that you just don't like the way that they act, or it's not, you know, it's not a, just a personality conflict. They've done something wrong. So what's the first step that you do? Number one, the first thing you do is you go to Facebook and you tell everyone, I can't believe brother so-and-so did this to me. 
Oh, wait, no, that's not what it says. It says, go to that person directly. One-on-one. -on -one. Just confront them about it. And, you know, <laughs> we need parents raising their children to deal with confrontations. I know confrontations can make you unsettled and uneasy, but it's the right way to deal with things when you have a problem with someone. Go to them face-to-face, -face, personally. You can settle so many problems that way. So we, we live in this weird society now where people are so quick to call the cops and to just start getting all these other people involved in escalating situations where you could just so easily solve problems by just dealing with them by yourself. You know, whenever I've had problems with neighbors, you know what I do? I don't escalate it to, and just start bringing in force to deal with people. I go over and talk to them. And you know how often that works? Almost every single time. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize. Oh, yeah, okay. I'm sorry. We could turn our music down a little bit. Oh, you're going to sleep? Great. Fine. No problem. What, whatever the problem may be, it's, you know, people oftentimes don't even realize that they're doing something that's impacting you and hurting you or whatever. Go to people first. You have a problem with someone in church? Confront them. You don't need to get other people involved. You don't need to get the pastor involved. You don't need to, you know, someone does you wrong, keep it between the two of you because you can gain your brother. You can just be like, oh man, I didn't realize that. Or, oh man, I'm sorry. You know, yeah, I did that. I'm sorry. And all it takes is just, is just that confrontation to, to, to get them repentant and say, okay, I'm sorry, I did wrong. Now, if it doesn't work, if it doesn't work out through that and they're just still just like, hey, I didn't do anything, you know, whatever. Then what says, take with thee one or two more. So does everybody know about this problem yet? Nope. Say, okay, well, we need to, you know, obviously we can't solve this just by ourselves. Let's get one or two more people involved in this. Let's try to add just some outside people to hear it, establish what's been said so they can help resolve this situation. Now, again, if, this, if even that doesn't work in a church setting, then it becomes before the whole church. And at that point, then, there's going to be a final judgment made by the church, and it's going to be, you know, this is what the judgment is, and if the person who's in the wrong or whatever, they don't like that, then it says here, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. And basically, it would be like a first Corinthians 5 situation where, okay, well, we're not going to, you know, you're not going to submit to the authority that God's given to the church, and this is what we've deemed to be appropriate, then you're out. But no, you know, Matthew 18 has nothing to do, though, with like someone just being a fornicator. You know, we're not, we're not going to judge as a church, well, should this fornicator be kicked out? Or, you know, this is a conflict between two people. But this is the right way of dealing with it. You start small. You start with just no one else needs to know about this. There's no reason for it. The only time anyone would need to know about anything is if there's a serious problem. Someone's commit like a real crime or something. Yeah, then, then you let somebody know about that and we'll deal with it and appropriately. And, and if, it needs, if that needs to get other authorities involved, then we do it. But this just has to do with someone sinning against you. They've wronged you. The principle is you try to deal with it personally, you know, with just the other person, no one else involved, and then you escalate it, just a couple people, and then ultimately to the whole church. Very important principles are laid out here. And again, no, it doesn't say talking to other people first. When you have a problem with someone, you go to them first. And nowhere... Does it say you need to publish this even once it gets to the, to the church level and just broadcast it everywhere? No one says, it. make sure you write in to the local newspaper and get this in print so everybody sees that this person who had a conflict didn't take the church's judgment. It's not worthy of that. The people who are worthy of the public rebuke is the false prophet, the predator. You know, people actually need to be warned about it. Okay, watch out for this guy. You know, when we kick people out for being perverts, we'll call them out by name. 
and just say, watch out for this guy. They're not welcome back here. And the reason why is because they're a predator, they're a pervert, they're a weirdo. Like, okay, there's no fix in that. We're not looking for them to repent and come back. They're, they're gone. But the people who may do other things wrong, like here in Matthew 18 or even 1 Corinthians 5, the goal is ultimately restoration and repentance. So when you can keep a lid on it and not go about and tailbear and gossip and let everyone else in, oh, do you know all the juicy stuff that's going on? I don't want to know. I don't need to know. I don't want to know all the, all the garbage and sin that's going on in any other church. And I don't know why people think that I need to know. I mean, I've had people send me stuff from other churches like, why do you think, why do I, why am I getting involved in this? At the end of the day, I have nothing to do with the church. And the people inside of it, I have no authority over it, so who cares what my opinion is? First Peter chapter 3, I think we went over this a little bit this morning. Verse number 8, the Bible reads, we'll review this again. Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. So someone does you wrong, someone rails against you in the church, do you just go and make an all-out war against that person? No. No. That's not right. There are instances, these are the instances where someone does you wrong, but what about when there isn't an actual transgression? Because right? not everything is like someone's done you wrong. It's just more, I don't know, conflicts of, uh, of personality or, or whatever, just kind of social things. Sometimes people do things you just don't like. It's not necessarily a transgression, but it's just kind of like, why would you do that? Why would you stick me, you know, like we... I'll talk about this because this is just a whole nother situation way back before I was a pastor when we were just going to church and there was someone that would like leave us with their daughter. Okay. And, and I was just trying to be real nice and gracious and okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like, like we'll help you out. And this was way before I had more conviction on like, no, we can't, we can't be like, like, I don't want to be put in a position of being responsible for someone else's child or things like that. You know, there's other safeguards and other reasons for that. I don't want to get into all that. But it would, it would bother my wife a lot that, you know, like, why are you kind of pawning off your child on us now? Now we got to take care of this person the whole day and everything else. It's not a real transgression, right? And it's something that we, you know, like I agreed to. But it's one of those areas where you can, it's a conflict, right? It's something that, okay, now she's upset and there's these, you know, these, these problems with people within church because I don't like that you're doing this and, you, you know, and where do you say things, where do you not? You know, these, these boundary problems, maybe some people kind of cross lines that socially you're like, eh, what are you doing? Um, you may try to ignore it at first, but it just doesn't go away. What do you do? How do you deal with that? Well, we go back to the principles that we already learned for these other more serious problems, right? Things that are actual transgressions. And let's put that into practice. How about you go directly to the person you're having a problem with? So in the situation I brought up, what we do to solve that is I go to the parents that were doing this and say, hey, we've got an issue here. We can't keep doing this or whatever, right? And straighten the matter out between the two of you. That's it. That's real simple. And it shouldn't ever have to go beyond that. It should just be able to be solved that way. But people have a tendency to get too, maybe some people, honestly, I think it like you don't want to upset someone or offend someone, but you know what? It's not worth harboring bitterness or resentment in your heart over a brother or sister in Christ, right? Someone that you're supposed to just be loving because you don't like what they're doing to you. Why don't you just bring it up and bring it up with tact and bring it up gently and not get all upset about it and humbly and meekly say, hey, you know, I, I, 
I need to talk to you because there's just something that's kind of been bothering me and you know you may not even realize it but we you know I, I want to I don't want this to become an issue at all for us and if you deal with things appropriately now everyone ought to be able to receive hearing that themselves first of all be a good hearer when someone comes to you with a problem like that don't get all emotional and upset and, oh i can't go to church now this person doesn't like me and, you know like have the right spirit and attitude of being able to receive because if you know if you love the person you don't want to do them you know put them out or cause any problems with them and vice versa right so this is the the overarching attitude that should be going i know it doesn't always happen and and no one you know people aren't perfect but if you can if you can be on both you know understand both sides a little bit it'll help the problems to go away but ultimately you go to that person first you don't need to start even asking advice from other people because now we start doing that you're getting other people involved and knowing about the oh this person's doing this this person's doing this just try to deal with the problem that you're having personally one on one and just talk about it bring it up it's better to get things out in the open between you and the person you have a problem with than it is the harbor and bitterness, resentment, because that's going to cause even further problems to where it can get to an exploding point, right? Of just, you're kind of keeping it all in and it's like, boom, it's like, whoa, where'd that come from? I've seen some people, they had, they had no idea, like maybe they're irritating someone and then the person's just like blows up. It's like, whoa, like, what did I do? They had no idea. You could just tell me before you blow up, right? And a similar issue, I had an instance where I was working a long time ago in Arizona and I was ready to quit my job because they, you know, I'd gone working there for a couple years and there's just like no raises and I'm not getting any reviews and stuff. And I'm just going like, what's going on? And I don't like asking for money. I kind of like just, I prefer to just be recognized for the work you're doing and then get compensated for it. But I'm starting to think like, well, what's going on here? And I'm already, you know, starting to look for other places and everything else one of the owners of the company talked to me and he's like he could see that something wasn't right something was wrong and he's like what's going on and i finally just told him i was like hey this is what's going on and he's like <laughs> he gave me a really good bit of advice of just saying you know you can go somewhere else and maybe you make some more money but what what are you going to do if that happens again you're not really you're not really solving your problem that way you can sponsor around but but you need to learn how to just deal with just bring it up, right? Say so. Now, now if they don't, you know, if we don't hear you or don't, you know, respond, he said it could be just as simple as someone forgot, right? And and should it be their responsibility? Should they know about it? Yeah, they should. But it doesn't mean that we're, you know, necessarily against you either. It's just a, it's just an oversight, which is what it was. And then after all that, they, you know, they kind of came back and gave me some, you know raise whatever and it, and it ended up working itself out but it's the same mindset right of just when you have a conflict go to the person where you're having a conflict with because oftentimes it can just be settled easily and quickly and then you don't have to worry and just continually about something going on and escalating um Turn, if you would, to Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4, verse 29, the Bible reads, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And this may have more to do with this morning's sermon, but I didn't turn there this morning. Basically, if you don't have something nice to say about someone, don't say it, right? I mean, it's kind of a, a real watered-down version of this verse. But he's saying, you know, don't let corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. It should be good to edifying someone, right? There, there's so many things that people can say that just there's, there's no point to it at all. Now, obviously, there's, there's a time for rebuke, 
But again, if you need to rebuke someone because they've done you wrong, that doesn't need to be public either. Deal with that rebuke in person. Someone does you wrong or you see someone that, they, that you think they need to rebuke, rebuke them privately. And if it's a friend that you don't live by and you don't even have their phone number and you're just on social media, you could private message that person too. You don't need to be publicly rebuking everybody. It's just, there's no point to it. Usually the reason is because you want other people to jump on board with you and get a whole mob behind you or whatever and, and get some satisfaction from other people cheering you on. And at that point, is it about correcting that person or is it about showing you know, how hard you are at, at rebuking people and that you're willing to rebuke people? I don't know. Sometimes I wonder when I see things like that. And oftentimes, you got to remember, is it even your place to be doing that? Verse 30, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Put away the bitterness. Put away the anger. Put away the wrath. Put it away. Be and be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. It's a spirit of forgiveness. It's a spirit of, of tender-heartedness and being kind. That alone is going to go a long way with personal conflicts. Be tender-hearted towards people. Be forgiving. And we need to understand this too, okay? As a church, a, new, a young church, a growing church, we're going to continue to have more members come and be a part of our church. Hopefully, Lord willing. I mean, Lord willing, God's going to be bringing more people in as a result of soul winning, as a result of whatever outreach we could possibly do. And people are going to be at all different varying levels in their spiritual walk. And some people are going to be more carnal than others. And some people are going to be more prone to doing wrong things or wronging you. And as you spiritually grow, you need to be able to learn to just say, okay, you know, someone may take advantage of me. Someone may do things like, you know, I, I mean, I've had that happen I don't know how many times. You know, you lend people stuff and they break it. You lend money out. They don't pay, you know, whatever. You need to learn to just say, okay, you know, I, I bless them. I hope, I hope that they can, you know, become better better Christians and, and be a little bit more responsible in the future, but I'm not going to make a big deal out of this. I'd rather just be able to still love them and have them come to church and have them grow, right? And, and if they do things like that, okay, well, yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to keep lending you stuff when you just break all my stuff and you're not paying for it. Whatever. Like, I'm, not, I'm not stupid. I'm not just going to just give everything up so you can just destroy it all, but I'm not going to hate you either. I'm still going to love you and I'll still pray for you and, you know, whatever. I, but there's going to come a point, obviously, where you're not just going to give up everything. I'm going to close on 1 Peter chapter 1. You can turn there if you want. 1 Peter chapter 1. So dealing with the conflict... Essentially, it never needs to be made public. Okay, you have these conflicts, small conflicts in church, never needs to be made public. You ought to deal with it with the person directly and no one else. And if necessary, you can try to get some impartial people involved to help you work things out. If it even comes to that. If, if you feel like, you know, I, I don't feel like we're seeing eye to eye here and that, you know, like, let that this, there might be a problem continuing to happen. Let's try to get a couple of people, faithful people, that we both can trust to just listen and hear us out and to help us to get through this conflict. And if it's still just, just too much to deal with and it's just kind of a, a festering thing, you know what, then we'll bring it before the church. And the, and the decision will be made and that will be that. And if people don't like the decision, 
then they could leave. And, and that'll settle it, right? And it's real simple and real straightforward. But if we can maintain the principles of allowing yourself to be defrauded and being forgiving and things like that, then hopefully we don't even have to have very much of the, the conflict anyways. But when you get people together, there's going to be. So don't, you know, it happens. And here's the thing. We all have to love one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. There is no, there is no getting around that at all. I mean, that, that is, I mean, that is a commandment and it ought to be there in your heart anyways. But you don't have to be best friends with everybody either. You can love people and pray for people and help people even though you may never go and hang out together, right? And that's fine. And for some people, it may be better off that you just don't, because you get on each other's nerves or something. I don't know. People have different personalities and you just don't fit together. That's fine. But you still love them. I mean, you may have a brother or sister to be like, man, they irritate me all the time. <laughs> it's not good for us to just go hang out together. But you know what? You still love them. And if they're in need of something, you're going to help them out, you know, because they're family. And you do the same thing in church. And you need to be able to understand, hopefully everyone can understand, if, if someone doesn't mesh with you and you feel like you mesh with them, don't get too offended if, they, you know, if, if someone's not wanting to spend a lot of time with you. And try not to read too much into it. Just say, okay, well, leave it be. You know? Don't cause extra problems and dig, oh, why? What do we, you know? Just leave it alone. Don't be too pushy. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 22, the Bible reads, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. Because that's what we're called to do. Love one another with a pure heart. It's not fake. It's not feigned. And if there's something causing you to, to, not, to for that, you think like that's just, it's totally fake because you're harboring resentment and bitterness, deal with that. Take care of it either by talking to the person or truly forgiving them in your heart and just looking past and say, you know what, I'm just going to not worry about this anymore and put it behind me. And true forgiveness, true forgiveness means it doesn't come up again. If it comes up again, you didn't really forgive them. If you're going to decide to forgive someone for something, it's done and gone and in the past. Someone's, someone's defrauded you with some money and you decide, you know what, I'm just going to forgive them of the debt. It's done. Don't keep bringing, you know, if you forgive someone, don't keep bringing that back up and be like, oh, but you didn't, you know, like, it's done. It's forgiven. Because otherwise that breeds the resentment and the problems and the bitterness. And that's not what we need. You know, resentment and bitterness within a church is toxic. It is within a family too. It's toxic. We want to do the most that we can as a family, as a church here. So um, ho you know, hopefully this, this has helped you. I don't know. I mean, sometimes people don't know what's appropriate or not. One of the biggest things is don't broadcast your problems. <laughs> Just don't broadcast your... That is, kids, take, a, take that away because you're living in an increasingly online world where everyone wants to know everything about every detail of your life. There's a lot to be said for privacy Amen. and just keeping things at the appropriate level. Let's not broadcast it all. Amen. It's on a need to know basis. Right? <laughs> you got a problem with someone, just keep it between you and them. Unless it has to get out, involve other people. And you know, I want to help people in this church. I do. As a pastor, I, I care about you and I want to help you, but when you have personal conflicts, please take the message now and try to work it out before coming to me and trying to explain, oh, this person's doing this and this person's doing that. Take these lessons first. Okay? Because I don't want to know the little things that irritate people. Because I don't want to think poorly about anyone in this church either. And if people aren't doing wrong to me, then great. You know, not that I want anyone doing wrong to anybody here, but you know, you know what I'm saying. The little things, 
don't try to get people's hearts evil affected towards brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for giving us wisdom and instruction on how to deal with, with problems that may arise um, in the body here, dear Lord. I pray that you would please just uh, give us the wisdom that we need. Help us have good discernment, understanding. And Lord, um, I love the people that you've brought together here in this church. Continue to add to our church. Help us to be able to, to do more and to reach more people and, and to be fully functioning and working together and not, uh, not resisting one another, but being able to uh, completely just be in unity, Lord. Uh, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.